As we continue our study in the book of Revelation, we're going to do so by keeping to the framework that we started with. We know that everything that takes place after chapter 3, going all the way back to chapter 3, when we transitioned into chapter 4, we talked about how those were the things that were to come after. These are the things that will happen after the rapture of the church. How many of you are happy with that? You're going to get real happy tonight when you see what's happening in chapter 12, <laughs> okay? But the reality is, is that we need to understand that those faithful in Jesus Christ, those that have proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, are going to be, if we are, spectators from heaven of these events. We're going to be with the Lord at this particular point in time. And we know that during this period of the seven-year tribulation period, in the last three and a half years of what's called the Great Tribulation Period, that literally all hell is breaking loose on the earth. Satan has been given authority to release the worst of the worst from the pot bottomless pit. And there is tremendous active demonic presence going throughout the earth at this time. Satan is trying to prevent what he knows is coming, but it won't work. We're now at the midpoint in chapter 12 of Revelation of this seven-year period. And over the next few chapters, what we're going to see is the bringing about of seven different personalities. Tonight we're going to see four of them. Personalities that, well, we'll see both good and we'll see bad. All are working to do that, which is God's final solution. Those that are of God are going to work the things according to God. Those that are not, well, they're going to try to keep God's plan from happening. The move to withstand God at this particular point in time is going to target Israel. It's going to target Israel in a way that has been consistent throughout history, but it is, as never before in time at this point. As Satan tries at this particular point in time to do what he's tried to do from the beginning, destroy God's people. The main theme of this chapter, if you're a note taker, <laughs> just title it Conflict, because that's what we're going to see. We're going to see conflict in the heavenlies, and we're going to see conflict on the earth between God and His people, and that old devil called Satan. At the end of the last chapter, we saw a celebration springing forth in heaven. Go back to chapter, chapter 11, verse 15. It says that the seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And last week we ended by saying what? Amen. Yes. From heaven's perspective, at the blowing of this, this seven angels trumpet, everything came into subjection to Jesus Christ. And we're like, okay, that's cool. We're, we're ready for that. It says, and everything in heaven celebrated that. Guys, that's us celebrating the fact that Jesus now, at this particular point in time, has now taken control, complete control of the earth. And it says that his reign will last forever and ever. The outcome is certain. It's happening as far as heaven is concerned. But John now is going to be given a vision. He's going to be given a ringside seat to a fight that takes place in a couple of different venues. First off, it's going to take place in the heavenlies. And we're going to see a fight that takes place in the heavenlies. And we're also going to see one that takes place on the earth. And they're going to happen at different times. So we're seeing across that aspect of a near prophecy and that which has already happened, as John is going to now describe the events that will take place at this midpoint in the tribulation period. In verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Chapter 12 opens with the identification of the first of these personalities. And it's very important that we identify this woman properly. Whenever in Scripture there's opportunity for multiple interpretations or different points of view that are supported by Scripture, there's nothing wrong with exploring those different views. We talked just last time about how the identity of the two witnesses in Jerusalem based on their characteristics kind of pointed towards one of them being Elisha and the other one potentially being Moses. We can't prove that by Scripture, but it was a, a good biblically-based speculation, and it was okay because it really doesn't matter who they are. What matters is what they do. And so by 
looking at the Bible and taking what is a good and educated biblical view of the potential, there's no problem with that when we see those types of things in Scripture. However, what we see here must be interpreted properly because it's foundational to our understanding. Who is this woman? Well, throughout history, she's been a lot of different people. Unfortunately, with very bad and inaccurate interpretations, the Roman Catholic Church believes that this is the Virgin Mary. It's a hard reach because there's no reason or, or thought or anything in Scripture at all that would indicate that Mary will ever take and give birth in the heavenlies. And there's also yet, though, combined with the other assignments that they have, any proof that she is a perpetual virgin or nor that she is the queen of the universe. So there's some problems there. The Church of Christian Science believes that this is Mary Baker Eddy, their founder, and that she's giving birth to the Church of Scientology. I'm not even going to go any farther than that. Others believe that it's the church. Others believe that, that somehow or another that, that, that the church is being painted in this what is really a twisted and turned around example. Guys, understand, the church does not give birth to the one that's going to rule forever and ever. The one that's going to rule forever and ever gave birth to the church because it's Jesus Christ. Amen? The only contextual and theological sound interpretation to identify this woman in Revelation 12 is that this is an example, this is a representation of Israel. We talked about how literal interpretation is always the best. It's always the safest pro approach. When we look at Scripture, we need to look at it literally. If there's symbology, the symbology is going to be identified. In this case, John tells us right from the start, this is a great sign. This is a symbol. It's a picture of what it is that he's recording. And as we look contextually at this woman, we find that it fits perfectly with the symbology of Israel as the one who is chosen of God to bring forth the one who would rule the nations. We're going to see more of this in verse 5, but we can also hold to this interpretation by using sound Bible interpretation techniques. Standards and principles for interpretation, if you will. In the study of Scripture, there are certain principles that have been established. And how many students of the Bible know such terms as hermeneutics? No, never mind. <laughs> but there's principles, there's guidelines, there's a way to study, just like there's supposed to be a scientific approach to science that has been lost also. There's a scientific, if you will, or a logical approach to studying God's Word. And the idea is very certain to allow for consistent interpretation of God's Word and allow Scripture to validate Scripture. Among these principles is something that is called first mention. And the way that first mention works is the first place within Scripture that something is mentioned sets the tone and the direction for what that means throughout the course of Scripture. First mention. Well, we got to go all the way back to Genesis 37 and verse 9 to see the first mention of what identifies Israel as this. You remember that young man that had a vivid imagination and wild dreams by the name of Joseph? He had a lot of dreams, and some of his dreams got him in trouble. In verse 9 of chapter 37, though, he says, Look, I've dreamed another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and eleven stars bowed down to me. Oh, you remember, that didn't set well with his brothers. It didn't even set well with his dad. But he would have said 11 stars because of the 11 stars, if there were to be 12, he would have been one of them. And so when we look at this consistently, what we see is Bible interpretation based on consistent application establishes that this is, in fact, Israel that is being identified. The one who gives birth to the rule of the righteous one who will rule forever and ever. And we know that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, born of Israel. So why is this important? Why all this time to talk about Bible, Bible practices and techniques and study? Well, here's the deal. God's not done with Israel. And it's important that we understand that we're seeing Israel specifically portrayed in this period in time, halfway through the tribulation period, without exception that God is not finished with His people Israel, quite to the chagrin of those that think that He is. Guys, if you think for a minute that Israel is done, they're not. They're still God's chosen people. They are still 
and will be involved in this process of the end times prophecy fulfilled. In verse 3 it says, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. And this dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Personality number two, identified here in verse 3, but given specifically in verse 9, is none other than Satan. In this verse, we're given insight, though, into the nature and to the character of Satan. He's called great because he has great power. Satan has the ability to be able to control the nations of the world. He has the ability to be able to influence governments. He has the ability to be able to take and to exercise all types of evil within the world while it being deemed and called good. Satan is said to be fiery red. And this is probably a, a bad characterization because it doesn't mean that he's red in color. He's not like the monsters portrayed in the movies with a, a red swishing tail and, and horns and a pitchfork and, and, and fiery. That's not what this is about. Satan is being deemed as being fiery red because of his murderous ways, because of the ways that he interacts with the world. From the very beginning, Satan set out to destroy mankind. Why? He wanted to be God. He has no, however, regard for human beings. Unlike God who arranged his son to come and give his life for us, Satan could care less about the, the plight of mankind. When we look at the world around us, understand any time that we see human destruction, any time that we see loss of life, any time that we see wars, we see one of Satan's greatest ambitions is, is abortion. And the means by which any time that there is death or destruction or evil or violence that promotes death, Satan is behind it. It's his job description to kill and to destroy. Anything that he can do to disrupt. It says that he has seven heads that point to the completeness of his wisdom. This is interesting. Guys, how many of you know that Satan is pure evil? But he's not stupid. He's not stupid. As a matter of fact, he's extremely intelligent. He has been watching mankind. He's been watching the human condition. Now, understand, he has no attributes of God, as does Jesus Christ in relationship to his place as God, who is omnipresent and, and omniscient, omniscient and also able to take and to, to understand all things in, in the way of timelessness. God has got the ability to know everything from the beginning to the end and in the middle, before, after, and during. Satan doesn't, but what Satan has is the ability to study mankind going back as far as the Garden of Eden. And he knows how we're wired, and he watches. <laughs> Have you ever wondered how it is that somebody knows right where your buttons are? Has anybody in here got that going on in your life? You've got people that know right where your buttons are. Satan's been looking for buttons and finding them in mankind ever since the beginning of time, and he knows how to do it well. The problem is not necessarily mischaracterizing Satan, but not paying attention to his attributes to where many people don't even think that, that Satan has any impact at all. As a matter of fact, a poll that was taken about 10 years ago by Barna went to Christians, self-proclaimed Christians. They didn't differentiate between what kind of but Christians. Are you a Christian? Yes. And they posed the question, do you believe in Satan? 40% said no. Don't even believe any. An additional 20% said, well, I believe that there is a, a power, but I don't believe that it's a personality. I don't believe that it's a person, an entity, a real thing. It's just that which is wrong with the world. The remaining 5%, actually it was 35 that said, uh, or I'm sorry, 35% then said, yes, they believe that there was an enemy of God named Satan which leaves 5%, those folks didn't have a clue what to believe. They just were out there kicking. 60% said no, 35% said yes, and 5% said I don't know one way or the other of what were self-identified Christians. Guys, we got a problem. What's even more alarming is this same study identified with these same Christians asked them the same question about the Holy Spirit and got like and kind responses. 
Just as Satan was a symbol of evil in the world, the Holy Spirit to them was a symbol of what is good in the world. Not personalities, not real, not entities, a concept. And guys, this statistic is scary. If 60%, and this was 10 years ago, so I'm thinking it's probably not so much now, even worse than what it was then. If 60% of Christians fail to acknowledge the existence of Satan, the existence of the Holy Spirit, then they are completely incapable of withstanding anything that the enemy would bring in the way of an attack. They're powerless. And we don't have to wonder why there is such a lack of power in the church now. We wonder, when we look at the, so many people calling themselves Christians but lacking the power to be able to take and stand in the eyes and in the face of an attack and in the face of the enemy and the face of things that are coming against us in this culture. And we wonder why the church is imploding. We wonder why the church is crashing and burning. We wonder why the church is, is finding itself to where it can't stand on the right side of God's Word. It's amazing that we see the church folding under pressure to our government shutting its doors because of the fear that's being generated by, well, the enemy. Churches that are more interested in cultural standards than the standards of God. This also means that the church is failing to lead the culture where the majority of the population is unaware and is blinded that there's even a devil. And if they can't see him, then the ongoing plan that he has for destruction of mankind is being exercised without any hampering. The blindness is why the sexual culture, or secular culture loves to just blame everything on something other than sin and its author, Satan, when it comes to what's wrong with the world. Isn't it amazing how it's never sin, it's never anybody's fault? The problems that we have in the world, it's somebody's fault and the government's going to fix it. I don't ever want to make Satan the focus of our attention, guys, but listen. We have to know our enemy. We have to come to the place of understanding and recognizing who it is in order for us to withstand an attack. In Ezekiel 28 and 12, Ezekiel 28 and 12, it says, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, turquoise, and the emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. And you were anointed cherub who covers. I established you, and you were on the holy mountain of God, and you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Along with being wise, Satan is pretty. Perfect, it says, in beauty. His hands were like symbols. It says God gave him a great set of pipes. God gave him a voice. He gave him the ability to be able to, to most likely sing worship and praise in such ways that we can't even imagine. And most likely, very, uh, very many commentators have said that Satan was probably the first worship leader. He was on God's holy mountain having complete and unrestricted access, but Satan had a problem. Satan had what we would commonly refer to as a vision problem. He had a problem with his eyes. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 says, You have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, listen for it, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend far above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Do you see the vision problem? He had an eye problem. Satan was more interested in what he wanted than what God had prescribed. And this passage describes why Satan fell, but it doesn't tell us when. We know that the angels were created before the earth. It's given to us in the timeline. Satan's fall came before he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden. And to say that Satan fell, though, is not necessarily accurate. He didn't fall. He was thrown out. God, because of his pride, removed him from his anointed position in heaven, and he was cast to the earth, but he was still given and granted access to heaven. Here's what we know and need to know. Satan is real. 
He's a real entity. He's the enemy of God and he's the enemy of God's people. The Christian and the Jew are both prime targets of Satan. The rest of the world is Satan's playground. He loves to meddle in those who are, are blinded or who have refused to acknowledge or he would even recognize his presence and he's able to do so with an anonymity to bring about destruction. But in Christ Jesus, we have the power not only to resist but to overcome the devil. Jesus has won the war against Satan and in Christ we're told that we're what? More than conquerors. Oh, how can you be more than a conqueror? I just want to be, I just want to like sometimes win. I know, we've already, we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Looking back now at this woman giving birth, it says she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. The male child of Israel, this next personality is none other than Jesus Christ. Christ who came to save the world through his sacrifice on Calvary and returned to heaven, but will also return to rule with a rod of iron. Currently, right now, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of the Father, and He's interceding for you and for me. The woman, it says in verse 6, fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that she should feed, or He should feed that, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Get the picture of John viewing this vision almost as a spectator to the events that are taking place. And he sees this woman give birth. The dragon, it says, is just all set to devour. Think about what happened as we start entering into this Christmas season, about all of the, the, the preparation that took place, about the reason that there was all of this movement, the fact that there were those that were out and seeking the destruction of, of the Christ child after he was born. And this is all, the enemy has been after the Savior of the world since the time that He came into the world. But it says that He was taken up to God. But He's coming back to rule with a rod of iron. And I love this fact that when Israel flees, when the woman leaves, it says that the, the dragon was ready to take her, but the Lord is going to preserve this remnant of in Israel in the worst of the times of the tribulation. This 1,260 days is the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation period. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Say, Amen. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. You want a job description for, for Satan? There it is. Was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Satan has been cast out of his position and he's lost his status in heaven. But understand, according to what we see in Scripture, he still has access. Oh, now it's interesting. He no longer has a job. He no longer has position. He no longer has any authority. He no longer has the ability to be able to impact anything in heaven, but he is not restricted from being in the throne room of God. And we see that given to us in, in, in Scripture in relationship to Job, where it talks about the Lord asks ask Satan, where have you been? He says, oh, I've been, hey, I'm paraphrasing. So I've been going back and forth between here and here. I've been looking around. I've been doing things. And, and, and the job description of Satan, even now, and we know, is to stand in front of, of, of the throne room of God and to accuse us. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the accuser of the saints. And, he, and this is taking place in heaven. And I love the fact that we've got a much better lawyer. We've got an amazing attorney. We got an attorney that not only can defeat every argument, but is already, by the power of his blood, defeated every effort that the enemy would ever pose. But understand, this isn't the only place that Satan likes to accuse. Satan also likes to accuse us in our hearts and in our heads. He loves to be able to make the fight personal. And we've just got done talking about this. I guess, guys, we were just there. But at this point, John sees this great battle taking place. And Michael, the archangel, the fourth personality of this section. And his armies fight against Satan and his demons. And Michael prevails, and Satan once again now is cast to the earth, this time losing his access to heaven. And this victory is acknowledged in heaven. Look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren 
who accused them before God day and night has been cast down. So Michael fights against Satan. He's thrown down to the earth. Now he no longer, at this point, has access to the throne room of God. And Satan's not happy. Man, we're going to see in a minute that he is fit to be tied. Satan is no longer able to accuse the saints before God. And up to this point in time, that was his number one job description. But again, understand that he loves to take and he loves to accuse us personally. He loves to come to the place to where he brings around that thought. He brings around that, that reminder. How many of you in here know that you're not good enough? Okay, but why does he have to keep reminding me? Don't we just love it when somebody just continually points out our flaws? As the accuser before God, he also is the accuser within our hearts. Satan loves to point out our weaknesses and our faith and our flaws. He loves to bring condemnation. And guys, just Sunday, how many of you were here on Sunday? Put your hand up. Good, then I'll talk to the rest of you. Just on Sunday, and go back and read chapter 8 of Romans. What do we read in chapter 8? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And we talked about how there's a test to determine as to whether or not we're under the conviction of the Holy Spirit or the condemnation of the enemy. You remember what it was? Conviction of the Holy Spirit will draw us closer to Jesus Christ. It will bring us to the grace and to the throne and it will cause us to cast our hearts before the Lord and to get down on our knees and say, Lord, I need your help. Condemnation, on the other hand, though, telling us and ridiculing us will cause us to run away from the things of the Lord. And guys, you know this because each of us have experienced this within our lives. There's been times in your life when the guilt that you thought that was back on your shoulders based on the sin from the past caused you to walk further away from the Lord than you should have. And it wasn't until you came back to the Lord, it wasn't until you came back to the place of listening and heeding the call of the Holy Spirit to come back before the Lord that you were able to take and reestablish the very newness of life that is promised to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So stay close. <laughs> Don't wander off. And you'll be all right. In verse 11, And they overcame Him, being Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to death. Our victory is not our own. You guys realize that, right? Any victory that we have, any forgiveness that we have, is not on our terms, but it comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm glad that, it, I'm glad that my salvation is not up to me. <laughs> I am so glad that it's not some standard that I have to meet, some set of rules or guidelines that I have to meet in order to establish a, a, a place of, of, of security in my salvation before Jesus Christ. I'm glad I don't have to meet a bunch of different criteria and do a bunch of these and those and do's and downs and, and, and the rest of it. That my heart before Jesus Christ, placing my faith in Him as my Savior, secures my salvation and thus then requires and allows my spirit to come into the place of communion with the Spirit of God where I desire to meet that which honors my Lord. It's from desire. It's no longer from a require. It's from a desire. And how much sweeter is our relationship with the Lord when it comes because we desire to serve Him because of His goodness rather than required to try to please Him on our own merit. Guys, it's not going to happen. We'll never feel free from the condemnation that comes from the enemy because we will never measure up. Remember, it was Satan that tried to tempt Jesus. Satan didn't want the blood of Jesus to be that which causes us to prevail. And he offered him a way out. You remember, Jesus offered him the kingdoms of the world out in the wilderness. He showed him, he says, you can have all of this. And people have often wondered, well, how was Satan able to offer that? Well, you know, again, he exercises power over the earth. And what he said basically to Jesus is, you don't have to go to the cross if you want power. If you want to be the rock star, if you want to be the big guy in God's, God's arena, that's okay, but you don't have to do it God's way. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to shed your blood. You don't have to take on the sins of the world. You don't have to do that. I will give you everything that you think that you want. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. And what did Jesus say? <laughs> it is written. And he, started, and he just went right back to Satan and he just said, no, that's not how this works. And by total obedience and submission to the Father, Jesus Christ allowed himself 
to be put to death, not being ashamed of the cross and what it brought, bearing your and my sins in order that we may receive eternal life by faith in Him. And He did so willingly. When Satan comes, and he does, and he tries to defeat you, and he tries to beat you up, you need to let him know that it's not about any of our efforts. It's about the blood of Jesus Christ. It's about the cross that stands between him and us. And if we can stand before Satan and we can tell him that he has no authority over us because Jesus has already won the war, the battle is already over. And the fact of the matter is, is because we belong to Jesus Christ, he has no way of exercising any kind of right to us any longer. The blood of Jesus Christ not only cleanses us from our sin, but it says here that it gives us the power to overcome Satan in our lives. But it also tells us that we will overcome by the word of our testimony. I love this. <laughs> I love the fact that by virtue of us testifying of Jesus Christ, that it creates an ability to be able to overcome. How many of you can testify to that right now, that by virtue of sharing with brothers and sisters in this body or with, 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 with in, in, and in other venues, that that has caused you to be strengthened in your walk and to be able, able to overcome things in your life? Yeah. Isn't it cool when you're able to talk to somebody and share with them? Isn't it neat when you listen to where, where somebody was in a struggle and you ask them how things are going and they just start praising the Lord and talking about how it is that they brought he, the Lord brought them through a trial or a tribulation or something that was going on in their lives, so and they walked on glass. And yet, by the time they got through it, they found total restoration by the Lord on the other end. And you go, oh, man, I really needed to hear that. I really needed to hear about how it is that God works in your life because the promise that we have is that same God, that same power, that same blood that cleanses is the same blood that we hold on to and the same power that we hold on to. Satan loves nothing more than to stop Christians from talking about Jesus Christ. And we see it continually in the intimidation behind what's being brought upon the church in our modern cancel culture that's running rapid. Just recently I read yet another article about a pastor in Sweden. And you know, Sweden's got some crazy laws. A lot of people in this country like to hold Sweden up as the perfect example of a society and a culture that will work under a socialistic type of environment. The problem is, is that they have specific strict laws about hate speech. If anybody says anything that somebody doesn't like, it's considered hate speech, you could be arrested for it. And one of the local pastors of a little parish, he's been there for almost 30 years, posted the scriptures that talk about how marriage is between one man and one woman, and it's ordained by God, and anything else is unacceptable based on the word of God, and they came and they arrested him for hate speech. Oh, now it's being carried out against him. The threat is being carried out against him, but the hate speech that they're identifying is the Word of God. Our culture that we live in, guys, don't think that it could happen someday. It's happening right now. This book, God's Word, <laughs> I don't need those things. It's hate speech to the world. It's been declared hate speech to the cancel culture that's being driven and coordinated by Satan himself. Why? Because it's the truth that would lead people to salvation and away from Satan's plan of destruction. It's not hate speech. We know that everything that's written in here is, is, is a love letter that's written to those that will receive it. And we're not, we're not yeah, actually, man, I've been doing this for a long time. And I can remember saying, someday, we may see pastors being arrested for preaching the Word of God. And I, I remember, I, I, I don't even think in my own heart, in my own mind, that I thought that it would happen in my lifetime. It was always further down the road, and we were always hoping that Jesus would come back before that happened, right? Today, it's happening. <laughs> Today, it's happening. Right now, as we are sitting here, there are those in the world. Now, it's not happening in this country yet, but boy, it's coming. The laws are being presented before Congress even as we speak. And if you think that it's about equality, it's not about equality. It's about stifling and shutting up and shutting down the testimony of the saints of God in order to be able to identify that there's salvation in one place and one place alone, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's what it's all about. And if you don't think that it's demonic, 
If you don't think that what's happening in relationship to all of this, this critical race theory and all of this promotion of equality based on gender identity and all of those things, if you think that somehow or another that that's a good thing for our culture, think again. It's not. It's being ordained and administrated by the devil. And its one sole and main primary focus and purpose is to shut the church up and to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ from being spread in the world. It's been the enemy's goal all the way along. And finally now, in the history of mankind, go back 100 years, go back 150 years, go back to the founding of this country when our founding fathers recognized and realized that we would only succeed if we did so based on the principles and the purposes of God and His protection and His provision. To a time now to where it's like God's not even in the picture. And as a matter of fact, if you bring God up, you're wrong. If you bring God up, you're a hater. If you bring God up, you're out of line. Guys, we're in it. It's on. And everything that we've been told in Scripture is coming about. Now, we shouldn't be afraid of it. As a matter of fact, we've been told all the way through. What do we say? This book brings a blessing. Those that hear it. Those that read it. Those that speak it out loud and follow its commands. There's a blessing. Why? Because we know what's happening. We know what's coming down. We know what's going on. And guys, I'm excited about what's happening right now. I know it's crazy. It's like, well, can't we just go back to better times than $1.87 a cent gallon of gas? Wouldn't that be better? No. (laughs) Because the more we see this happening, we know the closer and the closer we are to Jesus Christ's return. And we have a point and we have a purpose by which we're supposed to be here. Satan is seeking to prevent the church from overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of His testimony, but there's a purpose and there's a reason. We must not be silent. And there's a key. Look at what it said. They did not love their lives to the death. As we've been learning in this study in Romans on Sunday, how many times has the Apostle Paul declared that the the key to the the, the Spirit-filled life is to die to ourselves. It's to die and be resurrected in Christ Jesus. To die with Christ and be resurrected with Him. Guys, here's the thing. <laughs> the enemy can't intimidate a dead man. And I know I talked about this on Sunday. Dead men don't care. You can poke them. You can stick them. You can do all kinds of things. You call them names. You can subject them to all kinds of regulations and rules and Dead men and women that are dead in Jesus Christ and alive to Him in His Spirit don't care about what the the enemy brings. Because the enemy cannot intimidate us when, when we're dead to ourselves and alive in Jesus Christ. And what's being said here would have been extremely important to those that received it in John's time because it wasn't just a principle. It wasn't just something that was happening in theory. At the time that this was going on in John's time, the church was under real persecution by which if they did not declare allegiance and that Caesar himself was Lord of their lives, then they were considered enemies of Rome and they were scheduled and slated for execution. And so when he's talking about how they didn't love their lives even to death, he's talking about in this case for these people at that particular point in time, they were losing their lives physically. And guys, it may come to that for us. It may. Before we see the Lord's return, we may see Him face to face one at a time. I don't know how it's going to go down. I just know that it's going to. And when it does, it's going to be glorious. It says, Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. You know what this means? It means when Michael kicks Satan out of heaven for the last time, that we're going to have a party. Because that's where we're going to be. But woe, look at what it says, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that that he has a short time. Going way back to our study earlier, we talked about the woes. This is the last of the three woes that come with the trumpets. And it's truly a scary thing. Satan knows that he's going to lose. (laughs) Have you ever noticed when somebody gets to that point of recognizing that there's no hope that they very often employ the scorched earth policy? If I can't have it, nobody else can have it either, so I'm going to just take and trash everything on the way out. This is what Satan is looking to do right now, but his main target is going to be, once again, as always, Israel. 
Look at verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Satan has always sought to destroy the Jew. And we have a hard time grasping this because our modern culture has just dismissed the Jew as a problem. Israel's a problem. The Jews are the problem. If they would just give in and just give up and, and, and allow themselves to be conquered by other people, there would be no problem. Can you imagine how much even just in our lifetime controversy there has been over that little bitty strip of land? And the enemy wants nothing more than to wipe them from the face of the earth. The paint by the culture to put the Jews in a bad light, to cause them to be the problem, is all orchestrated by the enemy. And the absence of the Word of God in this culture, 200 years ago, we knew the value of the Jews within the Word of God and what it meant to this country. 100 years ago, we knew what the value was of Israel and how it was that we needed to continue to support them because those that, that bless Israel will be blessed by God and those that curse Israel will be cursed by God. Today, it's hard to find those that will even have an opinion one way or the other. What, we sh what should we do with Israel? I had somebody here not too long ago visit the church and they got offended because we have an Israeli flag over here on the stage. And they wrote me a letter afterwards and they said, how dare you have an Israeli flag? Don't you know how evil those people are? And I thought, no, I don't. Oh, I know they're messed up. I know like everybody else that they need Jesus Christ and many of them don't have Him. But I also know that Jesus Christ hasn't given up on them and I know that God hasn't given up on them. There's going to be a day when the Jew is going to look upon their Messiah and they're going to say, where did you get those wounds? <laughs> where did you get those scars? How did that happen to you? And he's going to say, I got them in your house. Again, I'm paraphrasing. I got them in your house. I got them. And they're, and they're going to fall and they're going to worship their Messiah. They're going to recognize and they're going to realize what they've missed out on. Because God's not done with them. And the commands of God that He's given us to continue to support, to pray for peace, to, to, to take and to be those who bless Israel is still as valid today as when it was spoken in God's Word. It hasn't changed. If you really want to set yourself up for failure, set yourself against Israel. Go ahead. I'm not. I don't have a problem. I brought that flag back personally from, from Israel, from Jerusalem, the old city. And I made sure it wasn't made in China. <laughs> I'm just saying I'm just saying, you got to be careful when you go into those shops over there because you can find all kinds of crazy stuff. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and a times and a half time from the presence of the serpent. Again, a time and times and a half time is three and a half years. It's given to us on, on the prophetic calendar. And the Lord is going to protect this remnant of Israel as they flee to the mountains and the Antichrist, after he demands to be worshipped, is, is going to create an exodus of those that can escape Jerusalem. They're going to run to the mountains, and according to what we see in Scripture, the place potentially could be the rock city known as Petra, modern-day Jordan. And it's interesting, and it's an incredible study, guys, and I encourage you to do so. We're not going to get into it tonight. We don't have time. But to understand how God is going to supernaturally protect this remnant, protect those that he has called. And we already know that there's protected classes during this time of the tribulation period. 144,000 sealed saints, all Jewish, will make it through this period. But this now is the rank and file. This is what's left. And Jesus Christ told him, man, oh, pray that when this happens, that when you see the abomination of desolation in the temple, pray that it doesn't come in winter. Pray that you're not nursing. Pray that you're able to take and, and to be able to run and flee for this safety this, to this protected place. And I'm not going to spend much time on this either, but I want you to know in case you come across it. <laughs> there are some end-time prophetic teachers that like to suggest that the wings of the great eagle could be a reference to the United States. Because our national symbol is an eagle. All right. And the reason is that they want to see something in Scripture that isn't there. One of the things that we find is that, as far as we can tell, America's not in the Word of God during this time. We don't see a presence. And so they're scratching for See, there, there we are. America's going to still be 
supporting Israel, we're going to protect them. And you know what? If that's the way that God decides to do it, then that's fine. But what the Scripture tells us is that God is going to supernaturally protect and to reserve a remnant based on His means and His ways, and it doesn't matter what it is that we want to try to add to it. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might chase or cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opens its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring to keep, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Satan is going to continue to chase the Jew with the intention of destroying them as he always has since the beginning of time. His goal, total destruction. Because in his mind, if he can destroy Israel, if Israel no longer exists, if there's not a single Jew left on the the face of the planet, then Jesus Christ can't come back and fulfill the prophecy that he will come back to be the Lord over Jerusalem. But understand, the Lord is going to protect them. Even as we've seen in the Exodus where the Lord just showed up and created physical manifestations of His assistance through what happens in the earth. It says the earth is going to somehow or another just open up and swallow up this threat that this dragon tries to provide and tries to cause to come upon upon Israel. So for tonight, as we wrap this up, there's an enemy. Satan is real. Now, I don't say that so that we can all go, ooh, I'm scared. No, we don't need to be scared. We don't need to be afraid. There's no power. There's nothing that He can exercise over us because we are those who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. We are those that have been sealed by Jesus Christ. If we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, if by grace we've received Him, and by faith in Him we have secured our salvation, by placing our trust and our belief in Him, we have no fear. The lies of the enemy that try to draw us away from the Lord will have no power upon us. And we'll be victors in this world. And guys, man, we have been appointed for this time. We really have. And I know it's hard sometimes because you you, you look at what's going on and you, you, you see what's taking place in the news. How many of you have thought an island somewhere in the middle of nowhere looks really good right about now? Yeah. Let's just go someplace. Let's just, is there any way that we can get out of here? I've heard about you. I'm looking at some of these retirement communities, you know? Gated communities where they don't let anybody from the outside in, not even grandkids. But we were built for this time. God has ordained that everyone that calls Him Lord is specifically here and positioned at this time for His purpose and for His reason, for one thing and one thing only, and that's that we would not be silent, that we would stand up, that we would share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we would be those that would recognize that we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb. And that the word of our testimony is that which strengthens us and brings salvation to the world, and that we don't need to be afraid for our lives, (laughs) because our lives are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, even as we look at these things, Lord, and, and, and we should recognize and realize the terror that goes along with this. What's going to be happening on the earth? Satan is going to seek to destroy. And yet, Lord, as you always have, you will continue to protect your people. Lord, we're thankful for the fact that your word is revealed to us that we're going to be with you during this time those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And if that's you tonight, and if you're here, then you can take solace and comfort, and you can stand on that promise of God's Word. But if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, you're in trouble. (laughs) If you haven't placed your faith in the one true living Son of God, Jesus Christ, then you are in trouble. You're headed for this period. Should you live this long? And the drama and the trauma and the curiosity of what's going to take place in these days is nothing compared to eternity separated from Jesus Christ and God the Father. So if you haven't received Him, then you need to. There's no other way to put it. I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say, well, you ought to think about this. You ought to see if it would make your life better. 
Jesus has got a wonderful plan for your life, and he wants you to really be prosperous. Now, I'm going to tell you this right now. If you don't want to go to hell and spend eternity separated from God, you need to accept Jesus Christ. This is what is coming. I love the fact that he has given us and granted us and counted us worthy by faith in him the ability to escape that which is to come. But it only happens in his son, Jesus Christ. So guys, take solace. Look around tomorrow when you're at work, when you're out and about, and look around at the faces of those that are out there, the people that are out there right now that either, either don't recognize, don't have a clue, and just share with them the love of Jesus Christ. It's okay to tell people that God loves them. Especially at this time. Cap on the fact that it's coming up on Christmas. People will receive things during this month more so than they will in July. I always start with Merry Christmas. Isn't it great that Christ came into the world and we get to celebrate it? Oh, you get some weird looks, but you also meet some really cool people too. So be encouraged. Take a stand. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and have no fear for eternal life. Amen?